Politics is like bookkeeping. It kind of sucks, takes away time from the things you actually want to do, and you really have to keep on top of it, or it can destroy your business. That is why today we are welcoming two very special guests to speak with us. Dr. Joe Jorgensen, the Libertarian Party nominee for President of the United States, and Thomas Wright, a Republican gubernatorial candidate here in Utah. After our interviews with these guests, we will sit down with our own Joe Rangel with 2Evolve Coaching and Consulting to discuss what they had to say and how our own thought patterns influence our susceptibility to political rhetoric. I use big words to make me feel smart. I'm Cameron Porter, owner of Robin Hood Studios, and this is Venture Utah. Before we bring on our esteemed guests, we have a few relevant news stories to share with you. This week's stories come from the Enterprise, Utah's business journal. First, Congress has officially passed a new bill into law that gives businesses who received PPP funds six months to spend the money instead of only two months, and lowers the threshold for using the funds for payroll to 60%. By and large, this is good news. After all, 48,000 businesses in Utah received funds through the PPP, totaling $5.2 billion in funding. President Trump signed the bill into law on June 5th, which makes this somewhat old news, except that the Treasury Department has since issued further regulations on the bill, which are as follows. The 60% threshold is not a cliff, it is a slope, meaning that even if you do not hit the threshold and are therefore able to have the entire loan forgiven, you can still have a portion of the loan forgiven based upon how much you did spend on payroll. Two, if your loan was made prior to June 5th, you can actually still elect to use the eight week expenditure period if you wish. If your loan was made after June 5th, you are locked into the 24 week period. And three, the five year maturity on the non-forgivable portions of the loan only applies to loans made on or after June 5th. If your loan was made prior to June 5th and you need to pay some back, you will still only have two years to do so. And four, and this is a big one, the loan is now considered to be made when the SBA assigns a loan number to the PPP loan, not when the money is received. Now, these events should normally only be separated by several days at most, but several days can make the difference between having five years or two years to pay it back and having eight weeks or 24 weeks to spend the money. Big stuff and important to know. Next. In a recent Silicon Slopes webinar, the topic of the mental health of business owners was discussed. It was discussed that the stress, anxiety, and extra pressure you're probably feeling due to COVID-19 and the related economic shutdowns is near universal. Across the state and across the country, the people who run businesses, both large and small, are feeling enormous pressure to do right by their employees while keeping their businesses alive. They are dealing with questions of whether having to let people go or reduce salaries makes them bad leaders and wondering how to deal with all the things that have come with this massive economic upheaval. The main rule of thumb that came out of the webinar was to find those to whom you can open up and talk honestly about the problems you are facing and how it's making you feel. Obviously, you want to be somewhat choosy with who with who those people are, but you want to choose people who know you well enough that they already have a sense of who you are but are willing to tell you the truth even if it's difficult for you to hear. Other suggestions included setting boundaries, uh, prioritizing your work tasks, and scheduling escape activities, and never forget to balance work with the rest of life. It is critical that you are cognizant and taking care of your own mental health because your strong leadership is as crucial to the well-being of your employees and your business as making physical or logistical accommodations to the shutdowns. In addition to setting up remote work for employees and making other changes to the way the business operates, you need to be in a mental and emotional place where your employees can look to you as their anchor and their leader. Many employees are struggling with working remotely and greatly miss the social aspect of working in the office. Some are highly fearful of the virus while others are dismissive of it. It doesn't matter so much who is right as it does how you handle their concerns. Things have changed very quickly and new updates have been coming almost daily. As our state comes out of the lockdowns, remember that for many of your employees and customers, this is going to create additional anxiety and you need to be equipped to handle it. 
Alrighty, and with that, we will invite Dr. Joe Jorgensen to join us via Zoom. Dr. Jorgensen is a senior lecturer in psychology at Clemson University. She holds a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology, and she started her own business in 1983, raised two children, and has founded several businesses throughout her career. Dr. Jorgensen, thank you so much for being here. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks so much. So my first question for you is uh, a little bit of a long one. So here we go. I got it. I got it recorded here. So the government response to COVID-19 crippled small businesses, criminalized business owners, and made decisions regarding which businesses were essential and which ones were not. How would your response to COVID-19 have been different and how would it have prevented or mitigated the drastic impact to small businesses? Well, the first thing I would have done is not put everybody under house arrest. I wouldn't have shut down the economy. And I look at this as basically the largest assault on our freedoms in my lifetime. So I would have done two things uh, completely differently than how uh, President Trump did. The first thing I would have done is I would have cleared the way for testing kits to get to the American public. A lot of people don't realize this, but there were over 60 companies making testing kits, but the FDA only approved two of them initially, which meant that people couldn't get tested, so we couldn't see who needed to stay home and who could go to work. And uh, some people might wonder, well, so I guess those companies went out of business. No, they simply sold their testing kits to other countries around the world. And in fact, we heard in the news about Southeast Asia, how they had extensive testing. Well, yeah, they were using our testing kits because we weren't allowed to use them. The other thing I would have done differently than uh, Donald Trump is I wouldn't have said, hey, you only need to get tested if you have symptoms. Because at the time, the prevailing wisdom was 60 to 80 percent of people either had no symptoms or had very small, you know, very uh, small symptoms. And so uh, there was really, you know, he said there was no reason to get tested. I would say there's a big reason to get tested. That's one way to curb the infection. Okay. So, okay, that makes a lot of sense. On a more general note, uh, Let's, let's go ahead and talk about the difference between the Libertarian Party and the Democratic and Republican parties, because the Democratic parties always say that Libertarians and Republicans are basically the same thing, and then Republican Party says that the Democrats and Libertarians are basically the same thing. So how do you differentiate that? Well, I say that, yes, the Democrats and Republicans both want big government. And decades ago, we could say, well, they just differ in what kind of big government they want. Uh, Republicans want big government when it comes to social issues, and Democrats want big government when it comes to economic issues. Now, they all want big government, and I don't see a lot of difference between Trump and Biden because they both want increased spending, they both want uh, increased taxation, and they both want individuals and small businesses to bear the brunt of a lot. And going back to the coronavirus that you asked about, one thing that we're doing with the uh, package is we're basically bailing out large companies. And, you know, I jokingly say they call it the CARES Act. Yeah, they care all right about their lobbyists and special interests. So the Libertarian Party is the only party that says individuals should be in charge of their own money and their own decisions. So let the individuals decide where that money goes to. Let them decide which mom and pop stores they want to support rather than taking our taxes and spending it how they want to spend it. And last, I'd like to point out, because a lot of people say, well, but this is a desperate time. Well, studies have repeatedly shown that the private sector can create twice as many jobs as putting that same money in the hands of government. So there is no reason to have that money go through government if we want more jobs. So, so that brings up a great question, and I love that answer. So uh, in, in a Jorgensen administration, what would be the federal government's role in the economy? We look in general that the government's role is police, courts, and military. So the um, e economically, the role would be to collect the funds for the military and the courts. 
Police, we think, should be done at a local level, and we think that that's part of why we why we're seeing the problems right now is the federal government coming in and militarizing local police departments. So we think that the government should just keep the peace while you and I and other individuals are allowed to trade with who we want to trade with at whatever prices we want. We should be able to marry who we want to marry and basically set up our businesses how we want. And you mentioned that I have been I I have run some small business. Businesses. And a lot of people don't realize when we look at licensing, people say, well, that's good. It protects the public. What they don't realize is a lot of these licensing laws are created by the companies who already have a, a foothold in the, in the industry, who already have an advantage. And often what they do is they use these laws to keep competition out. And there are even extreme examples that are so ridiculous in which um, uh, for instance, in hair braiding and the beauty industry, sometimes they'll have them get certificates, even though the training doesn't even include what they're, the, the product they're going to do, the service they're going to offer. So uh, the people doing the service actually know more than the people issuing the licenses. So that's just, it, it's, it's just ridiculous. Absolutely. You know, I, I can definitely see the perspective there. And there's uh, there's always been a bit of a disconnect between, you know, the, the licensing is only as effective as the licensing body. Uh, and it can it, it is uh, subject to the interests of the people who've developed the licensing exams and subject to the interest of those issuing the licenses. And there's some concerns there, some legitimate freedom-oriented concerns there. Uh, on your website, oh, I wasn't... Oh, I'm sorry, do you mind if I make one more comment on that? Now, of course, I think it's great to have uh, bodies, to have uh, groups of people maybe give um, you know, some kind of rating for companies, but they should be done privately. So a lot of people don't realize, for instance, that Underwriters Laboratory, the little UL you see when you plug something into the wall, that's a private company. So I have nothing against people putting ratings and, and even having uh, voluntary boards or voluntary examinations, and we can have different levels. But this government one size fits all just doesn't work and it helps those who already have an advantage. Gotcha, okay, yes. So um, on your website, I wasn't able to find uh, very sp any specific information about the economic policies that your administration would pursue. Uh, and, you know, philosophically, the libertarianism is fairly easy to understand. Less government, good. More government, bad. <laughs> but as far as your specific uh, goals for your administration, what would you try to accomplish in the first four years? Okay, first of all, get rid of the income tax. A lot of people think, well, the government's going to fall apart without the income tax, but actually that's only about half of the funds. So we can, if we dramatically cut government, which we should, then we can get along without a federal income tax. I would drastically reduce the size and scope of military. The job of the military is to protect us. However, right now with them being in the Middle East and other places where they don't belong, they're actually making us less safe, not more safe. And so what I'd like to do is cut the budget there. Even if we cut the budget by two thirds, we would still tie for the largest military budget on this entire planet. So we have the largest budget by three times. So I wanna bring our troops home and turn America into one giant Switzerland, armed and neutral. Definitely you know, protect our shores, keep Americans safe, but there's no reason that taxpayers in you know, Alabama, Texas, wherever, need to be paying for the military defense of wealthy Europe. We can let France and Germany pay for their own. And as I mentioned, being in other places is doing more harm than good. And then last for social security. Right now, we, everybody knows our social security system is broken and uh, seniors live wondering, okay, do I get a cost of living increase this year? How much is inflation going to hurt me? Am I gonna be able to pay my bills? And what we would do is have an immediate opt out for younger people because they know the system is broken. They know they're not gonna see any money from that. For the older people who are dependent on social security, since their money didn't go into a lockbox as promised, <laughs> since their money uh, went to fund the government, what we would do is we would sell some of those government assets, such as downtown buildings, oil and mineral rights, and then we would just give those people a, uh, a lump sum retirement that was under their control, 
and not under control the whims of Congress. So it would be pretty easy to drastically cut the budget and, and actually have people come out ahead. That is a very interesting policy. I haven't actually uh, looked at that very much. And that's, I appreciate you bringing that up because that's something that I haven't evaluated. Uh, as far as uh, the effect on small businesses, so income tax, that sound, you know, the idea of, I mean, everybody would theoretically be in favor of getting rid of an income tax. Uh, as far as a small business, so uh, corporate income tax, uh, the corporate taxation structure, uh, what, would, what would change with the way corporations and small businesses are taxed? will drastically reduce them. Uh, and, and again, we're going for zero income tax because what taxes do is they put a, um, they, they're basically demotivating. And the one thing that, well, two things that income, uh, corporate income taxes do is they send businesses overseas. People go elsewhere around the world where they don't have to pay those taxes. So we lose those jobs. And also uh, companies say, well, what's the sense? Why do I even want to go after this extra business? Because I'm going to get such a small amount anyway. So we need to, we need to put the emphasis back on allowing people to freely choose how much they want to produce and they get to keep the fruits of their labors, which help other people as well. Because a lot of people look at businesses as, as somehow just because you're a business, you've got unlimited money and you're the evil guys and you should be able to, you know, somebody needs to rein you in. If you think about it, they're the ones who are providing the jobs. They're the ones who are who make America strong. The only way for government to create a job is to first take money from somebody else, which was made through a business, and then they offer the job. So the only true job creation is through a business. And what we've seen in our country is job creation through small businesses. Mm. Gotcha. We, I think we have time for one last question. Are you good on time if we do one more question? Oh, sure, sure. I've got another five or six minutes. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So uh, my last question is actually shifting gears a little bit from the economic concerns of small businesses to uh, more of the social concerns of small businesses. Just barely, uh, the Supreme Court uh, passed a ruling where, and I, I may get the exact details on this wrong, but I believe it was the Civil Rights Act now applies to individuals uh, and in the LGBTQ community. Uh, and, and I think that's actually it, just the LGBTQ community, uh, and which presents some concerns. It brings up a good conversation for people to have about, uh, you know, do businesses have the freedom, should they have the freedom to voluntarily decide who their customers will be, who their employees will be, uh, and all of that. Where, where does the Jorgensen administration fall on that issue? Well, the libertarian stance has always been voluntary associations, that you should be able to hire who you want to. And once we have, again, a one-size-fits-all government rule, then we end up with problems like, does a Christian bookstore have to hire an atheist? And most people would say that's horrible. Uh, you, you shouldn't have to do that. Now, I will add very quickly, though, that we've had government institutionalized racism uh, really since the uh, slaves were freed. Um, the, the story that I like to point out is, or the example is Rosa Parks. Everybody knows how she was a black woman who heroically said, I refuse to sit on the back of the bus. And uh, everybody cheered when she said she refused to be treated that way. What a lot of people didn't realize is that that bus that discriminated against her was a government owned, government operated bus. And only the government can get away with such discrimination. I mean, move, move that to today. And, and keep in mind, something like 60% of the ridership were black uh, in her days. Um, imagine if Uber decided to discriminate against the best 60% of their customers. They would go out of business as well they should. So um, I've so having the 1964 Civil Rights Act is fine just because the government had instituted racial uh, racism into the system. Um, however, we believe that those laws should have been had some kind of sunset, and that now they're probably starting to hurt more people than they're helping. However, since we do have the 1964. Uh, law, then absolutely it should include the LGBTQ community. Uh, if we're going to uphold rights for one, we have to uphold rights for all. But I would like to point out that the, the 
private market, the free market has done a much better job of keeping down discrimination. And one quick example, look at Walt Disney World. They were giving benefits to spouses of gay employees in the early 90s. <laughs> that was 20 years before Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were still saying they were against gay marriage. So again, when people have the profit motive, uh, they tend to not discriminate because they want what's best for their business and their customers too, too. And in, in our climate now where people get, a, people get um, fired for just posting something on Facebook that has nothing to do with the company. So uh, we live in a different time now. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Thank you so much, Dr. Jorgensen. I think that your perspective on this, uh, both as a libertarian, but also as a, as a psychology professor, someone who fully understands uh, incentives and, and how people's minds work and how people make decisions, I think uh, you have a valuable voice to add to the conversation on a national level. Uh, so thank you so much for being here, and I wish you a great rest of your day. Well, I appreciate that. And my boss would want me to point out I'm a senior lecturer, not a professor, even though the students oh. don't make a difference. And uh, to please come to my website at joj2020.com if you'd like to learn more about um, our movement. And we're just thrilled with how many non-libertarian volunteers we're getting. So we think we're creating a movement here. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty, our next guest is Republican gubernatorial candidate Thomas Wright. Mr. Wright has served as the chairman of the Utah Republican Party, is the owner, president, and principal broker of Summit Sotheby's, I probably mispronounced that, International Realty, and has served on various committees and the Dixie State University Board of Trustees. Mr. Wright, thank you for being here. Thanks, Cameron. It's always great to be with you. Um, so my first question for you would be, what would you have done differently in response to the coronavirus pandemic? Well, let's be fair. Look, the pandemic hit us out of nowhere. Nobody saw it coming. It's a highly contagious, very dangerous disease. Uh, there was no playbook on how to manage state government through a coronavirus pandemic. Mm. But there are a few principles that people can know about Governor Wright and how I would make decisions in critical situations. Number one is I do not believe in no bid contracts under any circumstance. I think you're handing a vendor a blank check. You wouldn't do that in your business. I wouldn't do it in mine. Uh, no bid contracts are dangerous and we've seen because of the investigation that's going on by the state auditor that that is no way to handle taxpayer money. And then number two is I don't like governing by executive order. Uh, I, executive orders have their place. If a pandemic hits and you need to make a critical decision in real time, the executive branch has that authority. But after a few days when it's reasonable for the legislature to convene, mm. in this case they could have, uh, you need to get the elected officials involved. You need to make sure that in our republic uh, that we the people's representatives making the decisions and having the executive branch have the oversight authority. So I believe in those checks and balances. I believe in that proper role of government. And in, in the case of the pandemic, the third thing I would say is the proper role of government is to disseminate information, to keep citizens informed, and then trust citizens to make their own decision. I believe mm -hmm. in freedom and liberty. Uh, we have civil liberties and constitutional rights that our founding fathers gave us and a lot of people have fought for over many decades. We need to make sure that we don't you know, give those away, even during a pandemic. So I wanna stay safe, I wanna do the right thing. I'm a business owner. I had places where I closed offices where I wasn't compelled to by the government. I did it because I identified ways for my employees to stay home and work, and I felt like it was the responsible thing to do as a business owner, so mm -hmm. therefore I did it. But there were other counties where I was forced to do it and compelled to do it. And then there were counties where I was compelled to do it. And I said, wait, why isn't real estate an essential service? And they, they ch actually changed course. So it's, it's that inconsistency that's troubling during these times. I believe in disseminating the proper information and then allowing citizens to make their own informed decisions. We have smart, astute people in the state of Utah. They'll do the right thing. Our job in government is to give them the information and the data and then allow them to make the proper decision. You know, as a principal, I love that. The idea that you know, give them the information they need to make a proper decision and let them make their decision. Uh, on that, uh, there were you mentioned uh, real estate wasn't considered essential at first, and then it was considered essential. Yeah, in some after. counties it was, and others it wasn't. wasn't. It was, it was, it's really hard to understand. And do you feel? Uh, Instead of being philosophical about this, let's talk about the, the right administration, the, the right governorship. Would you consider it appropriate uh, to? Uh, to decide which businesses are essential and which ones are not? No, absolutely not. I think I made that clear. I, I, think, I think what we do is we give out the proper information and we encourage people to do the right thing. 
You can, you can, you, that's a proper role of government to say, hey, this is what we hope happens. But at the end of the day, there's just too many nuances, Cameron. One mm -hmm. size doesn't fit all. And so then you get businesses running in saying, wait, aren't we essential and why aren't we essential? And you have some saying, well, I don't really feel essential. I could probably do more. And so you're just creating more problems than you're solving. Mm -hmm. a, a perfect example is if I'm a business owner, I'm a grocery store, and I want to require people to wear masks, that's my right as a business owner. And people that want to wear masks might seek out my store. And then there might be other people that say, you know what, I don't want to wear a mask. I'm not going to that business. So then it has its own, it has its own consequence, mm -hmm. right? And there may be business owners that say, I own a grocery store and I'm gonna let people make their own decision. That, that's what makes America great, is that we have our own freedom and liberty to make decisions. And then we have to live with the outcomes in a free market enterprise if we're a business owner. So I did that. I said, hey, you know what? We're, we're selling people's homes. I have 250 people in my organization. Uh, we're, we're going into people's private personal spaces. So we came up with a whole protocol that worked for our company based mm -hmm. on our values. And some of my competitors did things that I didn't think were responsible. But now consumers get to make their choice. Which business do they think is making the proper decisions? Which one's being led well? Which one's being responsible? And we, we actually gained a lot by having good practices inside our business that we were comfortable with according to our values based on the information that we were getting. And just, you know, and I think this was before you came into the studio, by the way, we recorded a news segment in which I was talking about a summit uh, or a webinar done at Silicon Slopes talking about mental health of business owners and mental health of employees and how it's just as important to make sure that those needs are met, that people, everybody feels comfortable, that everybody's anxiety is dealt with in a way that makes them uh, feel comfortable with what's going on just as much as making the physical changes, like where they're working from and, and things like that. And it sounds like you, you found a good approach for your business. Yeah, even before uh, Summit <coughs> County, as an example, um, you know, a few of my offices are located in the Park City area. And even before Summit County came out with their order, I had employees approach me and say, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're a little concerned about this. And I have a choice to make as an employer, you know? And I said, hey, let's get you working from home. And so when that, that order actually came, we were already doing that, mm. right? So people make the right decisions. They come to the right conclusions. Park City was the, one of the highest infected areas in the country. It was in the top five counties per capita wow. at the beginning of the pandemic. And that was because there's a lot of international people. There's a lot of people coming into that area. So I looked at the information and I said, this is the responsible decision. So I didn't need government to tell me to do it, right? Government has a tendency to kind of overstep their bounds and tell us what to do. That's not the proper role of government. The proper role of government is to give us the information and then let us make personal decisions and have personal responsibility. And do you feel that uh, uh, COVID-19 and the response around COVID-19 was more of a, a magnifying glass to magnify existing problems or, or did it introduce things? I Probably both. I think it probably introduced some new things, but I also think it magnified those. One of the things I've said consistently in this campaign and on my video, uh, on my website, I have a bunch of videos related to the Constitution. I, one thing that I've learned during this is we need to teach, and all of us need to teach and learn and understand our United States Constitution better. We need to understand that the rights that are protected there are actually given from God. They're not given from government, and they're not taken by government. They're given by our Creator, and they're inalienable to us. The Constitution is designed to protect people from taking them from us. And I think there's a misunderstanding there. So I think we need to get back to some of those founding principles that made this country great and make sure that our citizens, and I've done this with my children during this pandemic, teach those constitutional principles so that when government does overstep their bounds, we as citizens recognize it and we can stop it. Because a government that can take your rights, they will. The government will take your rights if you let them. They will overstep their bounds. We know that. We have to constantly be pushing back against them. And the only way to do that is by truly understanding what's happening. So kind of in the spirit of taking things back, you know, looking back at, uh, you mentioned specifically no bid contracts, uh, and you also mentioned uh, government by executive order. And I'm wondering, uh, outside of the COVID-19 pandemic, prior to and since, how are those two things and other issues with the way the state government's currently being run affecting small business owners? Well, whenever government's inefficient and there's fraud, waste, and abuse in the budget, that affects everybody because we're all paying into the system. We know that businesses will do best. And I'm, like, I'm the only candidate in this race that's a business that, that has a business experience and is a business executive that's a and has run a bit, you know, of a small business for a consistent period of time. For 12 years, I've been looking at financial mm. statements and dealing with hiring 
and retention and paying leases and making payroll. I'm the only one, and, and that I think is really important. But, but whenever government is involved in fraud, waste, or abuse, it hurts us all. We know businesses do their best when government gets off of our back and out of our wallet. Because if they give us and they let us keep more of our money, we will reinvest it in our businesses. And it creates economic development and it creates more jobs. But government has a tendency to think they do it. And some of my opponents in this race brag about Utah being the number one state in the country to start, start a business or the best managed state. And that's great, but they think it's government that did it. Hmm. And I've constantly in this race said, it's not the government that did it, it's people like you, Cameron. It's small business owners that get up in the morning and have an idea and take a shot and try to make something happen and then have to hire people because their idea is working. That's what makes us who we are. But government has a tendency to think it's them. And the best thing government can do is just get out of the way. Get out of the way, deregulate, don't tell us how to run our businesses, don't tell us when and where we can do it, take less of our money and watch what happens. And that's, that's what's made Utah great, and that's what I want to continue to do as governor. Now there's a lot of disagreement in the small business community surrounding the level to which business should be regulated. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh no, I, I mean, look, that's really easy. The less regulation, the better. And okay. look, we've seen with disruptive companies, their inability to come in and compete because of regulation that's old and antiquated. Mm. Tesla was a perfect example. Weren't allowed to come to the state of Utah because of a regulation that was written a long time ago. Uber, Uber was slow to get into the market. They, could, they couldn't get in, why? Because we had old regulations that were prohibiting them. We need to constantly be looking at regulation and constantly be eliminating it because by eliminating it, we can have a more competitive business climate and more competition is always better because it invites new entrants, it keeps those that are in on their toes, and it helps consumers get things for, for, for less. And that, that's really what it is. I have had regulation in my business. A perfect example, last year before I was running for governor, I took on the challenge of deregulating the real estate industry. In this state, one of the only states in the country, real estate brokerage owners can't own title companies because mm. of an old law that was written in right. Utah. And it was written to protect the title companies from not having to compete. It was protectionism. And I took that on, not because I don't like title companies, I love them and I know a lot of people that own them. Now they can own real estate brokerages, which I should be okay with. And I can own title companies and we can disclose that to consumers and we can make the services more competitive and drive the cost down. That's huge. Isn't that huge? I didn't even know that that changed. Yeah, it did. And that's why you, know, you, you see some real estate companies that have billboards saying, yeah, now we're doing title. Well, that was because we deregulated that. And that was a brawl. And, and even oh, in I our bet. legislature where you think that you know, this is the reddest state and legislators would want deregulation and free markets, a lot of people fought it. And they fought it because of their ties to that, to that industry. So we need to allow competition, right? We need to allow competition and regulation creates moats around industries. It's designed to protect them so they don't have to compete. That is un-American and as, a, as governor and as a business owner, I understand that and I will deregulate this economy. And I'll just close Cameron by saying, it's been about 10 years since we've really looked at the regulation in state government, that's too long. I can think of a lot in the Department of Commerce that we need to do to make Utah competitive and to keep us on top. And that's one thing government can do, is deregulate the economy. That's big, and you're speaking my language for sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not to show my colors or anything, but uh, uh, the idea of deregulating is something that uh, I think is, is a, at least a valuable conversation to have. Absolutely. And it's one that's, it's a complicated conversation. That was just one regulation that you mentioned, and there's... It, it was huge. And it it's changed, huge. It changes everything. Yeah. And, and, and it was so interesting to watch the, re the reactions. Uh, obviously, it was good for me. I still haven't started a title company. I did it more out of principle. Sure. Uh, but to, to watch the industry come in and the, the, the arguments that they would make to try to protect their industry was really fascinating. Mm. And uh, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone. They had the right to their opinion and they had the right to protest and to, to try to stop it. But I'm glad the legislature saw the wisdom in it and the governor signed the bill. And so that was one step in the right direction of deregulating our economy. Now, I think I got time for one last question. Sure. I want to ask you uh, in, in, you know, when you become governor, what would be the role of the Governor's Office of Economic Development? Well, GoEd started about 15 years ago, and it had a very narrow and specific vision of what it was gonna do. And by and large, it's accomplished that. We've, we've relocated and, and had a lot of great companies come to the state of Utah, but we've done it at great expense. And as a Utah business owner, I have to admit that I felt a little slighted at times, right? You pay into the tax system in Utah, and then they take your money and 
give it to other businesses to get them to relocate to Utah. We've had tremendous growth in this state. The Wasatch Front, the four counties along the Wasatch Front have seen a lion's share of that growth. We're pretty packed in. We're falling behind on our transportation infrastructure. Our air quality is not where we need it to be. So I think the time of incentivizing companies to come to the Wasatch Front needs to be looked at and reevaluated. I'd rather see all that money, especially during the pandemic, put into lowering the rate for all businesses so we can all participate equally in that incentive. Mm. But from time to time, we may need to incentivize companies to come to Utah. Maybe it's to Northern Utah. Uh, to some of those counties that haven't seen a lot of economic development or to other places in rural Utah where we need to, you know, we need to uh, diversify the economy and revitalize the economy. They actually never came out of the last recession. So I don't want to close the door totally on economic incentives, but I think it needs to be seriously looked at and it'll be a different era of GoEd uh, under Governor Wright. Be one of the see. first things I do. Fantastic. So for people who want to get involved with your campaign, uh, if they want to volunteer or contribute or anything like that, what is the best way to do so? Yeah, well, people have their ballots. So if you have your ballot, open it, vote for Thomas Wright and Rob Bishop for governor. Uh, if you want to go to our website, write my last name, W-R-I-G-H-T, Utah.com, like the Wright brothers, writeutah.com. You can go and order a sign. You can make a contribution. You can volunteer to help. We'd love to have your help. And this really is a grassroots movement. I mean, Cameron, I was told when I got in, politics is an insider's game. You're an outsider, and they don't like outsiders getting into their game without their permission. So we need more people like us to run, right? We don't or maybe need, like you, but I well, <laughs> we we need less professional politicians, mm. less career politicians, and that's really why I'm running. Mm. I have the political experience to make it happen because we've talked earlier about my role at the RNC and the Utah Republican Party. So I know how it works. I can hit the ground running on day one, but I've never held public elected office. Mm. So I can bring that fresh perspective. And you know, the most dangerous day for a business is when? The day you are successful. Mm. Because it's easy to get complacent. It's easy to start patting each other on the back, thinking that you're always gonna stay on top. And cheerleading replaces leadership. And what we need is to remember that every day the battle has to be won. Success is a daily battle that has to be won every single day. And, and in Utah, we've had a lot of success. It would be easy to become complacent. Let's put people in that want to fight every day by deregulating the economy, making our tax structure more competitive, and remembering how we got on top and making sure that we do that every single day. So that's really why I'm running. If you believe in that, please join our cause. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me on. Alrighty, to wrap up this episode, we do have our longtime friend and partner, Joe Rangel with Two Evolve Coaching and Consulting. Joe's expertise is on are on mindset. They're all about uh, how you view things, about how you your perspectives can change to get better, to become more productive, to become more effective and help you reach more success. And so uh, we felt that his input on the interviews that we just conducted with two individuals running for office would be very valuable to discuss uh, some of the ways that they view the world, uh, their perspective and, and what's good about how they seem to view the world and what could be improved as well as uh, what we, the way we view the world and how we receive uh, the things that they're saying and how we can adjust our perspective to be uh, tuned for our success. So Joe, I guess my first question for you would be, uh, in those interviews, uh, w did anything stand out to you about the way that Dr. Jorgensen or uh, hopefully Governor Wright uh, viewed the world? I thought, uh, um so both of them were pleasant people, you know. I thought that uh, this is, again, it's just an opinion because opinions are from perspective. Sure. So I thought that uh, Dr. Jorgensen maybe was a bit altruistic in her statements, you know, just wanting for things, which by the way, th some of the things she talked about I thought would be great. Just don't know if they're possible within a short term, you know, but then mm -hmm. again, that's perspective. It's all about perspective. Um, the world is, I think, constantly ready for change right now. I thought that uh, Thomas Wright, right? You, yeah. you called him so many names that I can't remember which <laughs> one is. I don't want to call him Tom or Tommy. But anyway. Go with Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright. Um, no, but <laughs> with, I thought he was very personal. I thought he has some really good ideologies about um, the government not controlling and people using free will, which I tend to... I tend to agree with. I think if we would all maximize the use of our common sense, we'd probably be okay. I mean, I deal with people all over the world, 
And a lot of the people in different states that have different levels of control and lockdown, I'm, I've had comments as just like, I should move to Utah. You know, I think, and that's a, to me, it's a pretty cool statement to the way that we run things here. Mm. I like that. As far as, I mean, a lot of the things that both of them actually had to say, I feel like boiled down to an essentially a live and let live philosophy where, you know, I will make the decisions that are right for me and my business and my family, and I will trust everybody else to make the right decisions as well. And something uh, Mr. Wright mentioned specifically was, if you don't like a business forcing you to wear a mask, then just don't patronize that business. And, and, I, and to a lot of people, that's not enough. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on why? Why do we feel like sometimes it's not good enough to just not patronize their business? There has to be some more consequence, something more to fight against that. Why do we feel that way sometimes? So what would be more than potentially maybe putting that company out of business? If that were a possibility, which um, I'm trying to remain kind of politically correct here, but so there are two, <laughs> there are two big warehouse stores in our area. One of them, it was really interesting to me, one of them after the quarantine said that people needed to wear masks if they were gonna visit their stores and that they wouldn't be allowed in if they didn't visit, if they didn't wear a mask. I found it interesting because they didn't require masks during the quarantine. Now maybe that's because there were less people coming in, I don't know. Sure. So I, will, I, won't, I won't tell you the name of it, you can go figure this out by yourself. But I can tell you that I used to shop that store and I had started shopping the one that was closer to our vicinity here recently and I thought, if they don't wake me, make me, I, I don't know if I'm always opposed to wearing a mask. If I feel like I need to, I, I probably will. I don't like them, that's my opinion. Sure. I've done some studies on how useful and beneficial they actually are. You know, like you had talked about on your last segment, I think we should educate ourselves and not just blindly, you know, stick something on that could be recycling our own germs back into ourselves. But that's just, that's just my perspective. Anyway, I thought if they don't make me wear a mask, I'm gonna start shopping at that store more. And I went there and they didn't. And I have not been back to that other warehouse store since then. So I, I don't know what more we could do. You know, can you, can you have public displays? Can we disagree? Of course. That's part of what our country allows us to do is the ability to have free speech. It doesn't mean we're always gonna have the same ideologies that somebody else does or another company has. Uh, I don't think that anybody out there that's imposing regulations on individuals is doing it to try to harm those people. I think they're all thinking that they're doing things in, in the general populace's best interest. But sometimes I don't feel like that's in my best interest, you know? I don't know if that answers your question or if that's a bit... It does, right. you know, for the, I mean, it, it was a little bit roundabout, but you did get there and I appreciate that because you also gave good information as you were going and it was a very interesting, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, so yeah, you did, you got there and uh, it, it was a, you know, a lot of good information on the way and it gave me the thought of uh, specifically the question about deregulation. Uh, Thomas Wright talked about this a lot, deregulating things. And the question I would have is, uh, as far as that, is that deregulation, do you feel that that is something that would be more... Is deregulation necessary because we don't trust each other? Or is it unnecessary because if we don't trust each other, we won't do business with each other? Or do we trust each other? I think for this is, again, this is my opinion, and, I, sure. and, and very much like you talked about in, in your uh, intro to the last session, I, I, look, I believe that for the most part we do trust each other. Just like you had said, I believe for, we don't have a racist country, but there are racist instances, there are things that are happening. For the most part though, no, I think, I think we do trust each other, I think we have a trusting populace. Are there pockets of distrust? Yeah. Yeah, but would deregulation have anything to do with trust or control? Mm. That's a good question. I don't know if you can paint with too broad a brush on that one. Well, because to me, deregulation, deregulation would be about letting go of government control. Mm. 
but should there also be some policies and guidelines? I hate to say that left to our own devices, sometimes we don't make the best decisions as individuals because we can get, we can get polarized. We're all human beings. We all have ideologies and opinions. And again, that goes back to what I said earlier, it's not gonna necessarily coincide with another person's. That doesn't mean we have to hate each other. It doesn't mean we have to do quote unquote wrong things or things that are gonna be um, destructive or hurtful to another business or another person. Mm. I do think though frameworks are important. I, I'm, that's again, my opinion. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think you're right. I mean, my, uh, from my, my perspective actually has changed a lot. My political perspective has changed a lot, uh, even as a result of my coaching with you. As I began to view the world in a different way and approach problems in a different way, uh, my own perspective changed. When I was a, a teenager, hardcore conservative. I, was a, I, I basically had a foam finger for George Bush. I mean, I, like hardcore conservative. And then as I grew into my 20s, I really became hardcore libertarian. I saw the inconsistencies with the, you know, with the conservative viewpoint, and I went hardcore libertarian, feeling, you know what, freedom, live and let live, leave me, do my thing, everybody else can be responsible for their own things. And that doesn't mean I, I don't care about them, I just don't believe that government can force charity and enforce that and, and do that. Uh, and since I've, co I've been coaching with you, uh, my perspective has changed in that, you know, focusing on things that I can control and things that I cannot control and also boiling things down to what I would, what the Chinese would call the zhongdian, which is the, the center point or the, the main, the core of the issue. And, and so I have been, uh, I guess you could say mitigated would be a word, I, mellowed is probably a better word, mellowed in my, uh, in my political views because I realized that, uh, you know, people, there are, there's people of all types. Some people are more altruistic, some people are more selfish. Some people are uh, they're less ethical, more ethical. They're more bound to uh, what we would call ethics and less bound to what we would call ethics. There's people all along that spectrum. And just as it's important for different branches of government to have checks and balances, the people in government need to be checked and balanced by the people not in government. And frankly, the people not in government need checks and balances from the people that are in government. We right. all need to have checks and balances uh, to I push forward and be as productive and free as possible. Yeah, a lot of people talk to me about you know, scheduling. You know, it's a big thing that comes up for me with individuals. And I used to be very fly by the seat of your britches, try to remember everything. But you know, when you get 60 to 80 clients in a schedule in a week, Oof. you cannot, I, you can't remember everything. I can't. And I live by my calendar. You know, yeah, I think we've kind of talked about this a little bit before. Now, things change like today i'm usually here a little bit earlier leave a little earlier I, I called the client that i have and said hey can i push off just a little bit so i have a framework but i came up with a phrase a long time ago probably has to do with some buddhist reading that i was reading it's called you know flowing rigidity so mm -hmm. i think we need to have a a rigid structure a framework you know things that we kind of live within but we also have to be able to flex and flow in between those things. Like we're here today, this is what you're where you're scheduled to be. If one of your children all of a sudden got sick and you needed to go home, we would not be here today. We would be recording on a different day, even though this is what you had planned. Mm. So I think if we can start to look at things that way and understand that there's ways to flex and, and grow and learn, then the world's gonna be a better place. You know, right now there's a lot of polarization going on. On, on both sides, on all sides. We won't even say both sides because there's a lot of different points of view out mm. there. And there's a lot of black and white thinking going on, which is causing people to get stuck. <laughs> As the case may be, unfortunately that's all the time we've got for today, but I appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to those interviews and come in with your thoughts and kind of share your thoughts on it. So thank you so much. Thank you. And that, thank you for tuning in to this extra special episode of Venture Utah. We will be back next week with another special episode because all of our episodes are special. Thank you very much. And we will see you then next Friday at 10 o'clock.